welcome to Good Vibes. This is Lisa Halk, the hippie chick. Um, I'm excited to have a very special guest with me today. Her name is Victoria Randall, and she owns a company called The Secret Cocktail. Um, some of you may remember her from CNA Fest last year because she joined us. Um, Victoria, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? Yeah. Good, good. Um, I know probably some of our members met you at CNA Fest last year, but for the people that didn't, why don't you tell us about your company? Yeah, so my company, The Secret Cocktail, we work in all 50 states to help individuals open up their own private nurse aid training programs. That's amazing. So would these be inside facilities or would these be independent schools? Uh, we mostly work with independent schools, but we do both. So we do facility-based, we do independent, proprietary schools, you name it. Interesting. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about what a CNA program might have for curriculum for those that don't know that might be interested in the career. Yeah. So the curriculum, the federal government oversees nurse aid training programs. So a lot of the curriculum is mandated by them. Um, there's certain points that have to be hit 75 hours worth, you know, regarding resident rights and talking about infection control and things of that nature. So um, about 75 hours, but each state determines if they want more hours or not. Okay. So the process is a CNA would come in and go through the program. Mm -hmm. Then they would apply to be on the nursing board to be right. included in that so that they could work in that state. Right. So once, but in order for them to even get on, to take the exam, to even be, get on the registry, they have to go through that training. So that's mandatory to get on the registry. Okay. And you said generally 75 hours, but are there some states that require more than that? Oh, yes. Um, the federal government said 75 hours. Um, California says no. We want 160. Ooh. Uh, Georgia, I know. <laughs> Georgia and, says they want 85. I've seen some states that want 120. Wow. Um, so is part of that training um, clinical as well as classroom? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. So you have uh, clinical, you have classroom, and we even have lab. And lab is more of when they get to do the hands-on, but with each other or with a mannequin before they actually go out and practice in real clinicals. Okay. So are there curriculums that you believe should be included in the schools that aren't currently there? Yeah, so I started my own CNA school back in ooh, 2015, and my company has been in business since 2017. So for about a little over five years now, we've been working strictly in CNA startup and curriculum development. And so I have seen things that are needed as well as employers. So we do a lot of uh, surveying employers to find out what oh. they feel is necessary and what needs to be added. And then we uh, use those recommendations to owners who are looking to start CNA schools. And I've gotten a nice little list of some things that they think should probably be included in the curriculum. Um, but whoever starts their own program has the choice on whether or not they want to add these. Okay, yeah. would you care to give us some examples of some of those things? Yeah, let's talk about them. So one of the biggest things that I think tends to come up is about professionalism and soft skill development because we know CNA um, is typically entry level um, position. So sometimes some of these people, not all, but some of them have never even had a job before. This is their mm -hmm. first job. So making sure that we ensure that they know like, you know, what to do in the workplace if something were to happen. Let's say you had a problem with a coworker. How are you really gonna work that out? Like, what should that really look like? And so if you've never had a situation happen before, you wouldn't know. So um, talking mm -hmm. about that, talking about interviewing skills, a lot of people, this may be their first time interviewing. So what does that look like? And even if you have been interviewing for a while, like I get scared to interview, you know, tomorrow <laughs> if I have to, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And don't you think it's important in that interview process? I think a lot of people think I'm being interviewed by that person, but I think it's really important for the applicant to be interviewing the employer also. Are they a good fit for you? Oh my God. I stress that all the time because I have actually implemented curriculum development. I'm sorry, um, professional development in my curriculum. So I say the exact same thing. Look, it is not all about what they what you can do for them. It is also about what can they do for you. Mm -hmm. Think about your goals. Think about what it is you're trying to do. 
are you wanting to go on to become an RN or a speech pathologist or whatever? If you are, then maybe you should be thinking about whether or not that employer actually offers tuition uh, reimbursement, sure. right? Yeah, that's a great yeah. point. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think are maybe some other things that like professional associations possibly like us? Is that something yeah, that you think that they should look at? I think that kind of falls like underneath um, advocating for your profession as well as stress management. I think that encover, encompasses both. Okay. Because if you, stress stress management is already a part of the curriculum, but it's a very small part of the curriculum. Mm. And they don't really talk much about, I mean, they may talk about like meditation and, you know, it kind of stops there. Yeah, so, we know that's a stressful job. Oh yeah, like, you know, you're dealing with death and dying you're dealing with a person, you know, going from a walkie talkie to now suddenly they're almost, you know, just out of it and not themselves. Like that's a lot to take on. Yes. Um, you know, seeing wounds, seeing family members who are upset. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's a very stressful job and understanding how to relieve stress is so important. So, but we need to think about a little bit outside the box. So like, what else can you do to alleviate stress? And I think one of the things that we should be teaching in the curriculum is, joining professional associations like NACA, because if you join a professional organization, like I can't even begin to explain what happened at CNA Fest amongst the CNAs. You know, being able to have those discussions, to, to let go and vent. You know, you can't just vent to anyone. Right. Um, you know, it, you have to be very careful about that. So you can't vent to anyone. Other people, they may not even understand what you're talking about, or they may think you're being insensitive. Hmm. Um, another person who's in the profession gets it. Right. Yeah. So utilizing professional organizations as a way to, you know, be an outlet to help you get things off your chest, to talk about things and to vent to other people that understand. That's important. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. I also feel like it gives them a larger voice. They may feel like they don't have a voice in a topic, mm -hmm. but when you are with a group of 30,000 people that all do the same thing, that gives you a much more influential position to be in when you're talking about laws and different things. Yes, mm -hmm. so true. So that's another thing I think needs to be in the curriculum, teaching CNAs how to advocate for their profession, to advocate and speak up on behalf of themselves and the appropriate way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we want to just, you know, vent like, oh, you know, all these patients I have, I, I got 30 something patients today. This is ridiculous. I'm not coming in tomorrow. Why do they keep doing this to us? You know we all been there but that's not really the way to deal with it and to handle it so we need to teach and equip cnas with the ability to understand hey there's channels and proper ways you need to go through to get this fixed for your voice to be heard and that starts with maybe doing some research to find out okay what have other states done maybe like out in california they just recently implemented a, um, a law for ratios for uh, na for nursing assistants did you hear about that I, just a tiny bit. Was it they increased the number of CNAs that were necessary for, mm -hmm. for yeah. the long-term so community? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You have to have so many CNAs based upon whatever, however many uh, residents you have, which, again, the only reason why those laws were made is because people spoke up and they went through the proper channels. And we need to equip all CNAs around the globe with the same ability or the same knowledge to do that so that they don't have to work. I mean, come on now, we all know what's appropriate and what isn't, but sometimes things happen anyway. Right. And we have to go through channels to get it right, unfortunately. So um, I want them to know how to do that. Sure. I can understand that. Well, Victoria and I have been talking about since she starts CNA schools, developing um, student memberships for the schools to be able to offer to their CNAs going through the programs. So yeah. we're gonna be working on that and coming up with it. Any students that are out there now, you can still join our organization before you're licensed um, and you get all the benefits of any other member and that's just $30 a year. But we're hoping to bring this to the schools so as part of your curriculum, you will get the membership. Yes, and that would be awesome. And I know that instructors, nurses all around, uh, they definitely see a, a huge advantage to that. 
And um, I, I can't understand any reason why anyone wouldn't buy into such because again, we want to, it's our duty to equip CNAs with all types of resources and outlets that they need once they get into the profession. And that's a huge one. Being able to be a member of an organization to A, understand how to advocate for your profession. B, be around like-minded individuals that will that you can vent to, that can help you come with ideas on how to do things that maybe you've never done before, right? Right. Um, to go to an event annually, which by the way, was the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> we do love CNA Fest and I'm one of the organizers this year. So I've got lots of fun things planned. So. Oh my gosh. So last year, I'm sorry, I just want to talk about Nope, do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> last year, I thoroughly enjoyed the zip lining. <laughs> That was a team building experience for sure. Yes. Um, reassuring each other to gain the confidence. You can do it. You can get up there and just having that moment to laugh and share that different moment and or experience with each other. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, what else did I really like? I really liked how a lot of the CNAs were getting up there on stage and speaking and telling their experiences. And again, like I, I was saying, showing how they're advocating for the profession and and showing others how to do that too. Like that's huge, being a leader in the profession. There were so many CNAs that were leaders in the profession. Mm -hmm. It just made it like a, a tearful moment of joy for me. Oh, that's beautiful. We love hearing that. And Lisa Sweet, who you know does her hero segment mm -hmm. on stage. Oh my gosh, that one, I cry like a baby. I have to go like clean myself up afterwards because it always makes me sob. I love hearing those stories. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm definitely planning on being there again this year, and um, once again, I will be definitely uh, donating to the cause and supporting a CNA to attend as I did last year. Um, I think that CNAs all over need to know about this and know that it is um, it's stress management, it's advocating for your profession, and those are things that how would they even know to do if it wasn't in the curriculum? Mm -hmm. No, I understand. So we hope to have a lot of really fun things this year that are also educational. We're going to be, um, for part of our fun time as a group building, we're going to be doing the like the CNA Olympics since we've got the Olympics coming up and we're going to have different events that they can compete in together. And then I'm trying to get, uh, I've found this wonderful gentleman who does therapeutic drumming in the long-term mm -hmm. care settings. And I think he's gonna come and, and speak on that and let everybody, you know, play on the drums. And and so that might be something they can take back to their centers. So we've got a lot of fun things planned. Yeah, and again, you just said something important, like learning how to go out and educate yourself as a CNA, and then learn about like, what are the best practices that are helping residents deal with and cope with things, right? And then bringing mm -hmm. that back to the facility and saying, hey, I went to this conference and this is what they were doing for people who have Alzheimer's and this is awesome, we should try it. Like that is advocating for your patients and advocating for your profession. And how else or where else would you get that if you weren't aligned with some type of organization? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we're so excited to hear that you're gonna join us again this year and look forward to meeting you in person there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely going to be there uh, without a doubt, as long as there's nothing weird or some type of conflict comes up. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Well, um, I'm going to not take any more of your time. I know you're a busy lady, and but thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I hope that this was helpful and enlightening to, um, to uh, CNAs about things that they may want to think about learning or educating themselves on, and definitely to CNA school owners consider these as options to implement automatically in their curriculum. Because again, although the state has different requirements that you have to teach, you have the option to add additional elements to your curriculum. And these are some things you may want to think about. Well, and I know I was saying goodbye, but I want to put in something there. Don't you think adding those different things to a curriculum, if there are multiple schools in the area, that gives you a, an advantage? We oh, offer all yes. this that this school doesn't. <laughs> Right. It's a huge selling advantage because you're putting the student first. Mm -hmm. You're not just the bare minimum, the bare bones to get by. You're putting the student first and you're giving them what they may not even know that they need. And you're right. It's a huge, huge selling point. Um, that's one of the things that we really specialize in is helping people understand their niche, finding a way to make themselves different and then helping them develop specialized curriculum so that they can be different. You know, that's one of our niches ourselves. 
Let's all thank Victoria for joining us today. And we would love to hear what you would like to see included in curriculums in the schools. Because if you've already been through the schools, you know what you didn't learn in school. So give us some ideas and I'll make sure those are all passed on to Victoria. So you can comment here on the YouTube or you can go to Facebook where it's posted and, and comment there. And I'll make sure she gets all those comments. So we have a lot of exciting shows coming up this week. So um, until next time, peace out. Thank you.